Well, before we close out the evening, I would like to take a few moments to honor those in our community who have passed on. Gordon Stanton joined our board in October of 2014, but he and his family have known Dean Morton since he was at St. John the Divine. And during Gordon's tenure on our board, he helped us strengthen our new bylaws and energized our board meeting. And our condolences go out to his wife, Kitty, sons, Niles and Henry, and his mother, Phoebe, who has a long time been a supporter of the Interfaith Center. We also acknowledge the departure of Dr. Constantine Tsitsera. Connie had a distinguished career leading many high-level projects for IBM, which took him to the capitals of Europe and other places around the world. He and his wife, Litsa, were early supporters of the Interfaith Center, reliably attending our celebration with their friends. And Lisa, Litsa has graciously accepted our invitation this year to serve as honorary dinner chair. And we thank her for this important role that she has played in our dinner. We fondly also remember George Kentakis, founder and owner of Associated Cut Flowers. George and his son, John, generously provided the flower arrangements for our galas without ever taking payment. And we offer the Kentankis family the lo and our loyal floral designer, Simon Hooper, our deepest compassion. Yes, yeah, Simon is responsible, has always uh, been working on these arrangements that you see in the middle of, of your table. And uh, so we're so grateful for him recognizing the losses that he has suffered over these uh, past years. And finally, I'd like to thank and invite Muriel Borst Tarrant to the podium to pay tribute to our very much beloved and respected Interfaith Center board member, Tanya Ganella Frishna, who is a lawyer and activist fought for human rights of all indigenous people here and in the United States and around the world. So Muriel, if you'd be willing to come forward for just a moment, thank you. Thank you so much for this honor. Um, to remember my uh, dear colleague, I usually don't write down what I'm saying, but I felt um, I really needed to this time. Tanya was a woman of great integrity and vision. Her vision and times took me to a different level of my work than I never thought possible. We understood each other, respected, and fought for another because we felt that the international work was so very important. She is a lawyer and me as a woman of the theater. We felt that each other's work was just as important as the other. We admired each other's gifts, supported each other, and found strengths in each other's passions. Tanya was a rarity in this world. And I don't think there will be a time in my life that I will not miss her. We were true partners and true collaborators, and that's a very hard thing to find in this world. She was a woman of the people, a rare leader that comes not so very often to our communities. Tanya was pure brilliance and intelligence with a mixture of bravery that I so admired. She was my comrade, my fellow foot soldier, as we fought side by side for Native rights. We did many projects together on how to bridge the gap from the very important international fora, such as human rights, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the Doctrine of Discovery. We knew that we had to bring these very important legal constructs to our communities, and the discussion that we always asked one another was how. We always discussed what was the best way to bring this important international work for outreach to our communities. After many late night discussions and sessions and so many dinners, I can't even count, we decided that theater and the arts was the way to bridge that gap and bring it to the people. The first pages of the theater piece that I wrote, it was based on her work of where she, when she was the special repertoire for the preliminary study on the doctrine of discovery and the impact of indigenous peoples for the United Nations. It was done in her bedroom, I wrote this piece in tiny pieces of paper, and I did all the parts for her, and I sang all the songs and danced all the dances until her husband kicked me out and told me to go home. 
but I would go back the next day and I would have more of the script and read more and more of the ideas and sing different songs and I'd have more jokes and I would test on her once again. And if she didn't get a joke, she would take a beat and she would say, oh, I get it now. And I would tell her if I have to explain the joke, then it ain't funny. But the other important thing was that we would sit together and just discuss on what each word of the Doctrine Discovery was and the Declaration, and I would tear it apart and approach it like Shakespeare. And she would sit with me as we discussed for hours on ends what one, what one word meant and how to exchange it for another and how that would change the entire sentence and meeting. She would approach it as a lawyer and I would approach it as a playwright. But we both approached it as political activists. She taught me many things. But the one thing she taught me and her legacy to me was the work must continue. This piece that I'm going to read, it's just not even three minutes, was originally written as a Valentine for my Aunt Elizabeth, who passed away two years ago. And the first person to read it was Tanya, and she did the grammar, and we talked and discussed it. But tonight, I dedicate this piece to Tanya and thank her the only way I know how, and that is through my work. And it's how do you find the laughter again? But how do you find the laughter again, not with others, but with yourself? How do you justify your creative self that it needs to speak with your intellectual self and your emotional self? How do you do that and go on with your life and figure that it's okay to laugh and smile and create once again? The only answer we do have is that it is a personal journey. The same as giving birth as an individual unique experience. Death and the mourning process are also a very individual experience. There is not only one way. I realize after all was said and done, death can bring out the worst in us and sometimes the best in us. It brings out the gratitude, the rage, the anger, and the family drama. It makes those who know us hold you up when you can't walk and help you crawl. Friendships are strengthened and ties broken. You see the weave of time in the fragile center of a heart line. You once said that you belong to the club of survivors, and we all know what that means. We all know the time will come when someone you love must go on their way to the other side, but it doesn't make it any easier for us and the grieving process. You try to ignore, ignore, uh, go on and ignore the rage inside you, but you realize you can't help that rage that comes to you. It is a blackness of anger that grips and chokes, a rage at life and the unfairness as it makes you want to scream and argue with with the universe. It doesn't matter who is, it is ripped out of your life. It is on this earth for 89 years. Even if you knew it was coming, you are never prepared for the finalization of it, the reality of it, and there is nothing you can do about it. It's never easy to say goodbye to someone that you love. Surviving after death is like picking up your life once again, one piece at a time, small tiny fragments that are like tiny crystals of sand, and the tears are an ocean as the pieces fall through your fingertips. You realize the person who left had to go, and that is the way the world works, but its grief does not stop. The grief makes you want to stay in bed, never get up, always rest, never eat but you have to let go of the grief and the rage and the bitter anger. How do you come to the conclusion, not only intellectually but emotionally? Do you dance it with submission, numb it, smother it, sing until your voice is raw how? Then at one point, you come to realize they are gone and you are alive. You're alive to love and laugh and cry and move into the world. If that is what death teaches us, it teaches us, can we teach us something? I do not know, but I know what it has taught us is that we do not control the world. We don't have final say on matters. The creator has final say, and it's on the creator's time that we are here. The highest power in the universe has spoken, and we must accept it. Our faith in life is tested, and my faith in the Creator was. But as one said, you cannot box with God. But if you do, you will get the knockout punch. And as I was knocked out on the mat crying for solutions, I finally saw that all is well in the world. All is well, because that is a turn of life. There are no explanations. I came to see that we're only fragments of time within the great world that exists for us and around us. 
We are spiritual beings that are a force of light that inhabits this very body. Nothing is perfect. Nothing will always be forever. Nothing stays the same. But you can speak to the vine through death and know that there is some equation and that death is the common denominator to us all, but so is life. And you know that deep in your heart that you will meet each other again, somehow or some way, that your destiny is entwined with someone for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. And uh, we are honored to have uh, Tanya's husband, Herb, here with us tonight. And Herb, it's, so, it's such a great honor to see you. Thank you for being with us.